morning, Harbor Baptist Church and those who are friends of Harbor as well. Thank you for coming and listening in on the service. It is good that we can be together, even if it is through the media. We're thankful that we can be uh, together and gathered uh, together this morning. Go ahead. I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I do want to make a few announcements before we get into the preaching, but I want to give you an opportunity to turn your Bibles to where we need to be. Isaiah chapter 58. Got a few prayer requests of you. I'd like for you to pray, continue to pray for the Carew family as Brother Carew has lost his dad in New York uh, there to the coronavirus and his sister is still recovering from the coronavirus as well. So pray for the Carew family uh, as they have relatives in New York. Uh, one has gone on into eternity and the other is still battling uh, the virus. So if you could pray for them, pray for the Johnson family. They had one uh, relative in Louisiana uh, that has also gone off into eternity uh, because of the coronavirus and they have a nurse in Miami a family member who also has a coronavirus. Her name is Angela. If you could continue to pray for her, pray that God would raise her up if you would. And then pray for Tuppence Cruz uh, this morning as well and just pray for some special physical needs if you could pray for her as well. A couple uh, Also pray for our ladies. We have two ladies in our church, Jariah Stinson and Stephanie McNeely who are expecting. Do pray for them for safe delivering. We certainly thank God uh, for them, for their families and just pray that they will have a safe delivery. We will be having a, a virtual baby shower uh, for Jariah Stinson on on May the 2nd, May the 2nd, and that'll be at four o'clock, four o'clock. She's registered at Target, Walmart, and Amazon, and uh, there will be a Zoom meeting invitation uh, sent out to you uh, to attend that virtual baby shower, and uh, let's uh, all, all ladies just have a wonderful time uh, with her together as welcoming that new baby into the world, and, and we certainly thank the Lord for the Stinson family, and uh, we'll have one later, much later, uh, for the McNeely family as they've got a little bit to go uh, in their um, in the birth of their son, uh, but pray for both if you would, and we're thankful for them. And then birthdays, we got birthdays coming up. Uh, Joe Stepney's birthday is on April the 29th. And Dwayne Stinson's birthday is on April the 29th as well. Please pray for them. And then uh, Trudy Turner is on April the 30th. And Katie Jackson is on April the 30th. Did I say pray for them? Well, you can pray for them. But praise the Lord for them for their birthday. And be sure uh, to uh, congratulate them. Send them a note, a virtual hello, if you would. Uh, but all four of those have birthdays coming up. Again, Je Joseph Stepney and Dwayne Stinson both are on April the 29th. And then Trudy Turner and Katie Jackson are both on April the 30th. And be sure to send them a very, very happy birthday note. We kicked off our Sunday school this morning. For those of you uh, members and friends of Harbor, you received a, a Zoom invitation and had a successful Sunday school on Zoom. And we certainly thank the Lord for our teachers and it, and of course the classes, the people that, that uh, came on and we had a great time together. And we'll be doing that from here on out until we can meet uh, together again. I am so looking forward to that day we can meet together. Uh, well, anyway, we won't talk anymore about that. It's exciting to think about. This is not going to last forever. It's starting to feel normal, but it's not going to last forever. We will get back to uh, uh, where we were and meeting in church and, and all of the other things as well. But we want to pray to, that the Lord will, will release us soon. And also we want to ask the Lord to, to teach us what he wants us to know during this coronavirus. We're not hunkered down. We're not, we're not at a standstill position. We're progressing. We need to be growing as individuals and growing uh, as a church, growing spiritually and reaching out, figuring out ways uh, to love your neighbor and continue to love God. Uh, those things are very important. And, and I trust that you would. Anyway, let's take our Bibles. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58 for our message this morning. Isaiah chapter 58. We've been in chapter 53 for several, several weeks. And so when I said 58, it kind of threw you off a little bit, maybe. But Isaiah 58 is where we're going this morning. Isaiah 58 and verse number one, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse one. The Bible says, are you ready yet? Isaiah 58 and verse one. Cry aloud, spare not. 
lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching the God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast with strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light bring forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speak in vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as a noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And Father in heaven again, we're thankful this morning for the privilege we had to gather around the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for your, your goodness towards us. And thank you for the kindness that you bestow upon us. Thank you for the safety you give and the peace that passeth all understanding. And thank you, Lord, for a home in heaven. And thank you, Father, for the time that we have to serve you in this present day. Lord, use your word this morning. Speak to our hearts. Capture us, dear Father. May we... Uh, May we hear from heaven today, save any that may be lost and encourage every saint. Use me as your preacher, empty me of self and sin and anything that would hinder the preaching of thy word. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. But praise the Lord. Let's start at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. The book of Isaiah speaks of God's relationship with his people and his redemptive plan in the world. Indeed, some scholars say that the 66 chapters of Isaiah are a mirror of the 66 books of the word of God. The prophet Isaiah gives us the most transparent and most compelling vision of Christ. Davis asserts that Moses courageously left a comfortable life of sin in Egypt's palaces to suffer with God's people because he saw Christ who is the invisible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Isaiah saw him too, only with much more vivid detail. Isaiah saw Christ exalted and glorious, high and lifted up. When the seraphim cried, holy, 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 in his honors, the pillars shook and the house was filled with smoke. It was Isaiah who prophesied of his characteristics. He would be a given son, a governor, the one whose name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied of the virgin birth 700 years before it happened, and he prophesied of his suffering, substitutionary death, resurrection, and successful posterity in the world through those converted by his blood. He said that, as you know, in Isaiah chapter 
53. Isaiah preaches clearly of God's redemptive plan for mankind in general and his use of his people Israel in particular. Chapter one opens with God lamenting the rebellious nature of his own children. I'm going to read it to you for sake of time. In verse number 11, God asked the question, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and a fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of, the, of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who have required this at your hand to tread my courts? Listen to the language. What men call right religious practices, God calls profane. He would rather men rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. The relationship with the Lord is what he's saying. The relationship with God is far more critical than an outward ritual with no real heart commitment or change. Do you hear what I'm saying? God wants your heart. He, he wants your heart more so than just the outward looks. Anybody can look the part. Anybody can look like a Christian. Anybody can look conservative, if you will. Anybody can look like anything, but God is concerned about that heart about your heart. He wants your heart. If your heart is right, the outside will be taken care of. It does no good to look good and not be right with God. It does no good to look Christian and not be saved. It does you no good, friend. Thus, we come to Isaiah chapter number 58. The people are fasting and they wonder why God does not hear their prayer. He said, does God even know? We're up here afflicting ourselves. We're not eating, uh, but we're calling on God. Does God even notice is what they're saying. Fasting is a discipline practiced throughout God's word. Indeed, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights while being tempted in the wilderness. He gave instructions in his famous Sermon on the Mount on how one is to conduct oneself when fasting, maintaining a proper motive when fasting. Fasting is a discipline. However, as Jesus said in the New Testament and what Isaiah proclaims in the Old, it is a discipline that is to be applied appropriately like any other. Beyond the discipline of fasting, Isaiah's message in verse 58 declares God's disdain for outward ritual and his desire for true inward righteousness. God looks beyond the machinery of fasting and any religious exercise and looks at the heart behind it. More than being a church member, a Bible reader, a leader in the church, God wants your and my heart. More than being on the roll, saying I'm a Christian, God wants the lost person to be saved. God exposes religious hypocrisy, calling his people to his chosen fast of caring for others and delighting in him. That's that's the goal of every Christian. That's the goal of every person. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, all our mind and all our strength and to love thy neighbor as thyself. How does God look at your service and mine? How is our heart towards him and towards your neighbor? What motivates you and me? Would, call, would God call what you do his chosen way? Do you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know that if you died today, that you would go to heaven? I'm talking to two groups of people uh, this morning. I'm talking to Christian people and I'm talking to unsaved people. And in all, in all people, God wants the heart. For the unsaved man, God wants to save you and enter a relationship with you that he would know you and you know him. For the saved person, God wants fellowship with you. You're already in the family. You're a saved child of God, but God doesn't just want some outward show. He wants your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about this coronavirus deal that we're going through and, and we're lamenting because we can't meet together in a building, can't meet together in church, can't meet together in the pews and singing and all of those things and hugging each other, things of that nature. Perhaps God wants us to sit still for a minute 
Be alone for a minute. Do a little self-examination and ask ourselves, is my heart for God or do I just love the externals? Do I just love the outside show? Do I just love the singing for the singing, the preaching for the preaching, the fellowship for the fellowship, or do I love God? God wants your heart. God wants your heart. Let's let's talk about three important aspects uh, this morning, three crucial aspects that are found in this text. Serving the one who died for us and rose again. Number one, God exposes duplicitous hypocrisy. Whew, Pastor, that's hard. You're coming hard this morning. It's a hard kind of message. Let's read verse one, if we would. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. That was God's command to Isaiah. He said, cry, he said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. In other words, I want you to make this message very conspicuous. I want it to be out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want it to be out there. I want, I don't want, I'm not interested in you having a one-on-one -on -one with the leaders, a one-on-one -on -one with this individual or that. Call it out publicly. Let it be known. If a man ran across your, down your street naked, that would be pretty conspicuous. What you like? What in the world? What is wrong with that guy? Well, hey, this message is pretty conspicuous. It's supposed to grab your attention, grab you by the tie, fellow. Got your head looking at the Bible, say, whoa, is this me? It grabs you, grab your attention, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. I mentioned this before, but let me say it again. Jesus summarized all the laws of God into thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. A magnificent harmony exists between these two. They are not independent, but fit together beautifully. Love is a heart issue. Love is a heart issue having to do with the magnetic attractions of the heart. Hypocrisy is the enemy of love, both toward God and towards your neighbor. God tells Isaiah to cry aloud, to call out conspicuously the sin of the people. Verse one, he calls out the facade of religion. Verse two, rather, he calls out the facade of religion. Let's read verse two. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take the light in approaching the God. God is being a bit sarcastic here. Chil the children of Israel are not approaching God as a righteous people. Matter of fact, verse one, he says they're, they're filled with transgression. They are a rebellious people. They're living in rebellion. And he says that they're, they're approaching to me as, as a people that are righteous. They're approaching to me as a people that had not forsaken the ordinances, when in reality, they had forsaken uh, the ordinances. They approach me as a people that delight in me. As Jesus said, uh, you, you delight, you show delight with your lips, but your heart is far from me. That's what God is saying about the nation of Israel. Your heart is far from me. And he calls out that facade of religion. Verse three, wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge. Christians today face the same charge. Outward observance of church attendance, Bible studies, with little genuine sacrifice for the poor and needy and for the lost. Friend, what kind of what kind of foolishness is that? How is it that we can have Bible studies? We can talk about love of God and yet turn a blind eye to those who are lost and dying and on the way to hell, those that are in need physically. How can we not look at them and have some kind of compassion? Religion that does not result in care for the poor, the widow, and the orphan is defiled in God's sight. Take a look at James 1.27. So God calls his prophet to raise his voice like a trumpet, to declare to his people their sins. They were a people who sought God day after day and showed delight in knowing his ways. But the grammar of Isaiah 58 too implies it was all a facade. It was just outward show. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and called their religious facade. You know, you're like white, white sepulchers. You look beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Friend, 
You're, if you're saved today, you, you can't be dead inside, but you're not living for God like you should. There's not enough compassion in your heart for the lost people, your lost neighbor. And if you're, if you don't know the Lord, friend, it, it doesn't matter how many good deeds you put on. It doesn't matter how, how, how well you present yourself before others. You're dead inside and you need to be made alive by the Lord Jesus. Christ. The Lord G, uh, Isaiah, rather, he calls out the facade of religion. And God said, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. He calls out duplicitous living. Let's look at the latter part of th verse three again. Oh, I'll read the whole of verse three. Wherefore have we fasted, said they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no not? We're up here fasting. We've afflicted our soul. We're not eating. Do you even notice what's going on, God? Behold, in the day of your fast, God says this, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You should not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. You're not going to fast the way you're fasting and expect your prayers to be heard by me. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Hey, here we see that Isaiah calls out duplicitous living. It gets even more apparent in verse three when this people's arrogance toward God comes oozing to the surface. They arrogantly demand to know why God has not responded to their fasting and prayer. How did they know that God has not seen or noticed? Perhaps they were expecting some earthly blessing, a bumper crop, a military victory, a flow of gold into the royal coffers. They were purely mercenary in their religion. But even worse, they were blind to their own wickedness. On the day of their fast, they dealt wickedly with one another and with their workers. Their self-denial made them irritable. Their fast always ended in contention, even brawls. They were fist fighting, verse four, and they oppressed their workers with extra labor and harsh commands, verse three. God tells them plainly that such fast would never result in their voices being heard on high. Do you need God? Do you need do do you do for God expecting a return, expecting him to do something for you? Indeed, you cannot outgive God and you will reap if you faint not. That's true. However, we're to give and do and serve God because we love him. We're thankful for what he has done in saving us, not because we think God owes us something. Do you become irritable in, in your service? If our fasting makes us carnal, irritable, argumentative, and even violent, not to mention unjust uh, to others, it's time to repent from that religion. That's not a religion. That, that's not a religion that God is pleased with. That is not a religion that represents God. If serving God makes you irritable, if serving God makes you angry, if serving God may, makes you dislike your fellow man, maybe you need to check the way you're serving God. No, friend, when we're serving God, we're going to love our neighbor. Because if you love God, you're going to love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're going to love, well, let's put it this way. First John chapter four, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hate of his brother, he's a liar. For he that love of not his brother whom he have seen, how can he love God whom he have not seen? Can I say that again? If a man say, I love God and hate of his brother, he's a liar. For he that love of not his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he hath not seen? We've been made in the image of God. Amen. We've been made in the image of God. And therefore we ought to we ought to love one another. You ought to love the lost man. Oh, some people are hard to love, you say. You love them in spite of themselves. They are lost. They're on the way to hell. They don't know any better. They need Jesus. And sometimes it's hard to love, love your fellow Christian. Their, their, their personality rubs you the, long, the wrong way. Well, you, you deal with that. Long, you ever heard of long suffering? The Holy Spirit of God gives us the ability to suffer long, to love unconditionally. You don't have to love what a person does, but you need to love that person. And if you don't love that person in spite of themselves, how can you say you love God? God loved you and I in spite of ourselves. He saved us in spite of ourselves. He came uh, from heaven and died on an old rugged cross for you and for me in spite of us. Is we didn't invite him and wouldn't have cared if he did it. And if it were not for the Holy Spirit gripping your heart and challenging you, you would have never recognized yourself as a sinner. And when you did and you looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't say, eh, I don't want you. You've done too much. No, he loves you unconditionally and saved 
your soul. Praise be to God. We need to love others the way God loved us. The same way God loves us, we love others. If we love others the way God loves us, then we love God. We love God. That's it. That's it. God tells Isaiah to cry aloud against the facade of religion and duplicitous living. It's duplicitous to say you love God and not love your neighbor. It's duplicitous to try to do great things for God, but not do anything for the lost that they may be saved and for your fellow brethren that they may grow in the Lord. That's duplicitous. Duplicitous. And God is against that. Preacher, you're being hard today. I'm not trying to be. I love you. I'm trying to give you a message that's going to help you and help me, help us. We need to grow in this period of time that we're, that we're settled down. Examine ourselves. Look at ourselves. Why do I do what I do? Why do I preach the way I preach? Why do I, you know, all of the things, the singing, the teaching, the, 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 the serving, the, to the visiting, the saying hello. Why was I doing that when we were in church meeting together? Why did I do what I did in the Lord's assembly? Is it for the look of others or is it just because I love God? Dwayne Stinson preached an outstanding message in men's prayer. Men, you ought to, you ought to uh, come in on men's prayer. We got some men that really handle the word of God. Preached an ex- outstanding message. And I want to use this as the illustration. He talked about how this this time uh, of being sequestered at home was like a, a ball player in the off season. And how you handle your off season is how you will appear when you come out in the in the main game. Can I say this, friend? If you're you're either going forward or you're going backward, there's no such thing as staying steady as a Christian. You're either progressing closer towards him or you're slinking, sliding away from him. Give your heart to the Lord. Give him good personal time. Spend time with him in the off season that your profiting may be known to all when we gather back together. We want to come back not spiritually sloppy, not spiritually behind. We want to come back together on fire. We want to come back together stronger. We want to come back together more spiritual. People ought to see your spirituality. I'm not talking about how many how many uh, spiritual religious words you can say, I'm blessed, you blessed, we blessed. I like saying I'm blessed. I am blessed. I'm blessed by the best. I'm un- I like to get under the spigot where, 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 the, where the blessings come out. You know, I messed that up, but you know what I'm saying? I like all of those words, but I don't want to just use the words. I want it to be known. I want my life to exhibit a man that has spent time with the God of heaven, the God of heaven. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Amen. God is good. God tells us to cry, told Isaiah, cry out loud against the facade of religion and duplicitous living. Thirdly, he calls out his lack of favor. Look at verse five. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast? What you doing? An acceptable day to the Lord. You know what? You know what I want? I want favor on everything that God that I do for the Lord. I want God to find favor in it. I want God to find favor in the way I love my wife. I want God to find favor in the way we raise our children. I want God to find favor in the way our home is conducted. I want God to have favor in the way in the things I preach and the reason I preach and the motivation for why I preach. I want God to find favor in why I spend time in the Bible. I don't want my Bible reading to just be routine. Let me get a chapter in. Okay, I've done it. Let's hit over to Netflix or something else. I want to give God some good quality time. I want my my quote unquote religious exercises to be found favorable in the sight of God because God doesn't just have my time. God has my attention and God has my heart. He deserves it and I need it. He deserves it and I need it. Has there been a facade in your religion? Has there been a facade in your religion? Is your living duplicitous? Do you want favor on your life? Let's get right with God. Let's get right with God. You know what God expects? He expects merciful ministry. Let's look at verse number six. Y'all with me? Verse number six. He says, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry 
And if thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Here we see in verses 6 and 7, God graciously teaches his sinful people what kind of religion he will honor. This passage is one of the most important in the Bible for understanding mercy ministry, how vital it is to God, what it entails, how it must come from a heart of love for God and neighbor, how costly it must be and how richly God will reward it. What God demands is more soul searching than we can imagine. God's chosen fast, God's chosen service, God's chosen giving, God's chosen anything requires some soul searching because God expects it to be merciful ministry, merciful ministry. But what does merciful ministry do? Number one, it produces a denial of self. Look at verse six again. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? God's chosen fast. It is not this the fast that I have chosen? And he lists several things. He says, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens. Listen, you are to give yourself first and then you're ready to give materially. You hear me? Merciful ministry means you give yourself first and then you give your ministry. Jesus spent himself on behalf of his people, not just on the cross, but in his earthly ministry, he spent himself who were infinitely poor and needy. To spend yourself means to allow your heart to be knit with the afflictions of others. Fasting is a symbolic affliction, a voluntary refraining from food, which you can choose to end anytime you want. But the hungry have no choice and cannot stop the involuntary fasting they're going, they're doing through their poverty. The lost have no hope. They, they can't stop uh, their hopeless condition. They're being on their way to hell until they hear and receive the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men and women with compassion, men and women who are willing to be spent and spend themselves for the Lord, be spent and spend, provide merciful ministry. He produces a personal involvement. Involvement. Look, look again. It's not this, verse six, it's not this the fast that I have shown, to loose the bands of wit, to break the bands of wickedness, to undo her burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to deal your bread to the hungry, to bring the poor to your house, to cover the neck, to hide not thyself from thine own flesh. We may not be able to do these things physically, all of them, and it requires wisdom on how we're to practice these things. There are a lot of organizations today that handle the financial and physical needs of men. However, if you're a Christian, you have riches beyond this world that others need to have. We need to break the bands of wickedness. What's the answer? The presenting of the gospel and the godly living on your part and mine. The presenting of the gospel breaks the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burdens. How do you undo heavy burdens? How do you undo the burden of sin? How do you undo the burden of guilt? The gospel, preach the gospel. Let them know the joy of serving God and having your sin forgiven and walking with God and God walking with you and the peace that passeth all understanding that God gives to you. Present the gospel. How about letting the oppressed go free? Do I sound repetitious? Present the gospel. How do you let the oppressed go free? How do you let those that are un, that are being oppressed by society and the devil and their own flesh, how can they find freedom? Jesus Christ is the answer uh, to their freedom. Deal your bread to the hungry. I'm starting to sound repetitious. The word of God is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Discipleship. Take somebody under your wing and train them, help them, uh, uh, shelter them, take care of them. Bring the poor to your house. He said, preacher, I don't know if I can bring just anybody poor to my house. Sometimes, you, sometimes and we all get the opportunity to take someone in. That's not a thing. Invest in someone's life. We had that opportunity to, to do that. You can do that. But what is a home that everybody needs? And many people are homeless without it, a home in heaven. Present, oh, I sound so repetitious. Present the gospel. Everybody's a home in heaven. Some people will make their bed in hell. We don't want that. We don't want that. We try to make a difference. And it 
It's not just some words on our part. It takes some compassion in our heart to get out there and do something, to help people, to challenge people, to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cover the naked wall they need, the robes of righteousness that only Jesus provides. Listen, hide not thyself from thine own flesh. What's that mean? We're all men, born sinners in need of a savior. You and I who are saved, we just beggars that found something great, Jesus Christ, and we need to share it, with, share him with other beggars that they can know him too. Don't hide yourself from those that are lost. Don't hide yourself from those that are in need. Don't hide yourself from those that are spiritually destitute. Friend, it doesn't matter how much money they have in the bank, they still go to hell without Jesus Christ. Don't hide yourself from such, but present to you. You got family members that don't know the Lord. Get on, open up a Zoom meeting, look at them face to face and let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Have a compassion for your lost loved ones and lost friends. Let your heart be affected by the spiritual needs of others. The key concept is that we, is that we do. We're to give ourselves to the Lord and to our fellow man. Ministry, listen, it's personal. It's hands-on. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's living before the world. You go to the grocery store. Those people are afraid. They are. Give them a gospel tracts. Hey, there's something I want you to read. Something to bring some peace to your heart tonight. Give them a gospel tract. Tell them you wiped it off. It's, it's been sanitized. It's clean. And give it to them. Leave it for them for them to read. They need the gospel. People are afraid today of the physical. Let's help them to find assurance in the spiritual and come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. God exposes duplicitous hypocrisy. He expects merciful ministry. And when our hypocrisy is dealt with and our ministry is as merciful as the ministry of Christ, then God promises blessings and fruitfulness. Blessings and fruitfulness. Let's look at verse number eight. Look at that word right there. The very first word, then. Do you see that? Then shall thy light break forth as a morning, and thine hell shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, I am, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger as gossip, and speaking vanity. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, getting personal, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as a noon day. When I do right, then God is going to do great things for me. God is going to reward you, and I lavish when we put our concentration on the needs of others. You want a beautiful home? Put your concentration on the other person and not yourself. You want a beautiful neighborhood? Put your concentration on your neighbors and not yourself. You want to have be able to come and assemble together in a beautiful church, a loving church? Come with the thought process of not, not what can these people do for me, but rather, what can I do to be a blessing, to be a blessing? And then God will make you a channel of blessings because he then will he pour into you what you can then to others. Then and if. Now, more, let me tell you the things that God promises he will do. Verse number eight, we will be luminaries of his light. Luminaries of his light. Verse eight, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Uh, in verse number 10, and if thou draw thy soul to the hungry and satisfied the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. Yeah, listen, you know, it, it's like Israel is, is in gloominess and they're, they're in darkness. They're not portraying anything of God because of the way they live. Friend, that not that is not to be us. The light of Jesus Christ is to shine through your life and mind. And when I get rid of hypocrisy and duplicity and I have merciful ministry, God says, then the light of Jesus Christ will shine through you to others. People will know you're a Christian. They will know it. They will know it by who you are. Uh, we will be encompassed by his presence. Verse nine, then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. 
thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Well, you know what you know what they're saying? When you pray, it'll be like I'm coming to you, so here it is. Here I am. I'm showing up. God will put himself in service. I know that sounds so sacrilegious, but there it is. God will put himself to, in service to us. You know why? Because we have put ourselves in service and delight to him. Here I am. What you need? Oh, the church needs this. God said, I'll provide it. Uh, so-and-so needs this. They're, they're, they're in, they're, their heart is broken. Oh, God says, I'll show up. You know, God is right there when our heart is in it. God is... God will use us as channels of his blessings. We will have, here's, here's a beautiful thing. Your worship and mine is going to get, going to be so much better. We will have genuine delight in him. We will have genuine delight in him. Verse 11, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not, uh, whose waters fail not. God becomes our source of guidance. Thou, God becomes our source of guidance. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God leads me by his word and leads me by his spirit. When I'm in tune with him, I know what he wants me to do. I know the direction he wants me to go. When I am right with God, God leads me. And it's very clear. God can lead you that way as well. There's satisfa my satisfaction's in him. My comfort's in him. Uh, where did I get that? Uh, let's look again. Uh, in verse number, well, look at verse 10. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then verse 11, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought. God will satisfy thy soul in drought. When you're concerned about the drought of others, God will then uh, be concerned about the drought in you. God will satisfy your soul. God will meet your needs. God will come alongside of you as you seek to be a channel of his blessing to come alongside of someone else. He gives you strength. Look again and make fat thy bones. In other words, he invigorate your bones. He strengthen your bones, make your bones strong. God will give you strength as an individual, give you strength as a Christian. And then lastly, it gives you joy, joy. Uh, look again, uh, the latter part. And thou should be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. We read it again. Thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Remember, he's talking to people in an arid condition, a desert place. You'll be like a watered garden whose waters fail not. Continual, continuous joy, continuous refreshment, continuous peace, continuous long suffering. God said, I give you all of that when you give me your heart. In our entertainment crazed age, filled with Sunday sports, well, not anymore, and endless electronic recreations, the need to fast, the feast, may never have been more significant in the history of the church. We've got so many distractions, so many things that capture our attention, so many things that help us to focus on us, that there needs to be a good old fashioned chosen fast, a fast that produced the right fruit, a fast, a fast uh, that draws us closer to the Lord, that the Lord can give us the things that we need. God says, I, I, you know, you mistreat your brother, you hate your neighbor, you dislike, uh, you, you. And by the way, to not tell somebody how to be saved is hate. Mm -hmm. To to not share the gospel is hating them. God says, I can't hear your prayers. Psalm sixty six. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. I want God to hear. Hear me. I have to say, I need God to hear me right now. I want. I want to do. I want. I don't. I want no duplicity in my life. Mm -hmm. I want no hypocrisy, no facade of religion. I don't want to look the part. I want to be the part. I want God working in me, friend. If you've never been saved, listen. 
everything and everything you have as a facade. It's not. It's not. It's the church look, the church face. Uh, anybody can do that for 40 minutes to an hour. It might do that. But where are, you, where are you at home? Where are you when you're alone? How are you on the job? Are you the same person? It's either you live in a carnal life where God is not operating, any, operating in your life on a daily basis, or you're an unsaved person. You know of God, but you don't know God. You know of God, but you don't know God. Let me leave you with an illustration. You can take a counterfeit $50 bill. Now, I know you wouldn't do this, but it's an illustration. You take a counterfeit $50 bill, go down to the food, food lion and buy you some groceries. That's going to do you good. That $50 bill is going to help that person who gets paid because they're going to go out and they're going to buy their baby some shoes and some milk and, and take care of some other things with that $50 bill. The, the person who sold the shoes, they're going to use that to from the business or do some other things. That $50 bill is going to do a lot of good along the way until it makes its way to the bank. Because when it gets to the bank, the teller who is able to recognize real from counterfeit is going to say, this thing is counterfeit and it will then be burned. You can do a lot of good things in life. You can be a blessing to a lot of people. You can do. You can feed the poor and and clothe the poor. You can you can help the needy and all these kinds of things. You can have a wonderful life in this present life. But when you stand before God, unless you have Jesus Christ, you're counterfeit. You're counterfeit, and there is no changing on that side. Who you are is who you are. When you stand before God and without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you'll spend eternity in a place called hell. You don't want that. You don't want that. And we don't want that for you. We love you. If you'd like to know how to be saved, contact us. HarborBaptistChurch.org. Contact us. We'll get we'll get right back in touch with you and we sit down by telephone or Zoom conference or however you want to do it and sit down and speak with you about how you can know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Christian, let's be real. Let's be real with God because God is real and God knows everything. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves, let alone knowing each other. Let's get real. Let's get rid of facades. Let's get rid uh, uh, of duplicity. Let's have favor in our life, the favor of God. God will then produce some merciful ministry through us, and he will then do some wonderful things in your mind, satisfaction, strength, joy, and all the things, a light, all the things that God wants in your life and mind. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Again, we're thankful, Lord, this morning for the privilege to gather around the word of God. Thank you for how your word speaks and how it speaks to our hearts, how the Holy Spirit cries aloud in our hearts and shows us the things that we need to see and the things that we need to know. Lord, thank you that you would love us enough to let us know that you would draw us nigh to you. And may we have a close relationship with you, Father. You have saved us on purpose, not just to keep us out of hell, but to walk with you in this present life like you walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day before man, before Adam decided to fall. Lord, thank you that one day we'll walk with you in heaven forever. And in the meantime, we walk with you in this present life and of being a blessing to others. May we love you with all of our heart and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Save the lost. We'll be careful to give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, God bless you. Been great to be with you. I, I thought this was going to be a short message, but evidently the preach got a hold of me and we had a good time. I trust and pray. Uh, if you have any questions, contact me. Give me a call or text or, or contact us through the website, Harbor Baptist Church. Dot org will certainly get right back to you. Uh, I myself or someone on my staff, I'd be glad to talk with you about anything to help you spiritually to grow in the things of God. Love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful
Sunday. We'll see you soon.